title of this message is Biblical Grace and Natural Grace. This is our, the thesis statement, uh, John 3.18 through 3.20. We're very familiar with John 3.16. Uh, you know, I remember I was watching a football game for had the netting behind the goalpost, and the guy had a big sign up there, John 3.16. They kicked a field goal, hit him in the head, knocked him out. So we're all familiar with 3.16, John, John 3.16. But let's read this. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Aren't you glad you're not condemned? Whoever believes in him. Now, believe is a Swedish word uh, called beliefen. And when they did the translation, the King James from the uh, Tyndall Bible, which they executed, by the way, to give you some biblical history, um, they did not have a, a word for that word. Much of the King James is borrowed from the Swedish Bible, in case you didn't know. And... So the, this word belief in means to live in accordance with. And it doesn't mean mental assent. The, so the demons even believe mental, but yet they're not saved, right? So you can have a mental assent that he and believe in Christ, which many do, by the way, but they don't want to submit. So whoever believes lives in accordance with him. Now what does that mean? Not perfection, not that, that, that you're sinless or whatever, but you're, you're moving toward him. See, if Christ is in you, then you have grace. Grace is in you. And it's working its effectual work as we are going through this life and we are relying upon him and praying to him and clinging to him. I mean, that's exactly what we should be doing. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And this is the verdict. That's some powerful language. This is the verdict. The light has come to the world, but men love the darkness. You know, there are some men, they love their iniquity more than they love the light. And that's just a fact. You know, how many of y'all remember, uh, I think his name was Jeremy, uh, what was that guy's name? Uh, no, the one that was killing the kids and eating them. Dahmer. Jeff, thank you, Jeffrey Dahmer. Well, he used to take... On the corner, he used to go down and get tomatoes and take it to some of the elderly ladies there in his neighborhood. And they actually came to his court hearing to be a character witness. Oh, he was just a sweet boy. He used to bring his tomatoes all the time. But yet he was killing these little kids and dismembering them and then doing a cannibal act upon them. Um, you can do some good acts, but that don't mean that you're, that you're good. The light has come into the world, but men loved their darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light. I think it's pretty clear. It's got a clear distinction here and does not come into the light for the fear that his deeds will be exposed. That's why they don't come into the light. We got a bunch of people up there in D.C. and some other places. If we really knew what's going on, let me recommend a book to you. Uh, you will be mad. I'm warning you. But it's documented very heavily. It's called The Secret Empires. How politicians have been enriching themselves and having offshore bank accounts because of their uh, alliance with different government and foreign agencies around the world. You're going to be angry, I guarantee you. Drain the swamp. Biblical grace. So as I usually do, my, my customary thing to do is to give some definition so when we get into it, you know what it means. Biblical grace. Uh, biblical grace is a proceeding in time or order. A proceeding in time or order. In other words, it was the coming of Christ. 
So Christ was that biblical grace. It was in a time and order. The whole, we've been waiting for him to come, and thank God he did come, died for our sin, and but he rose again. So that's biblical grace. Everybody that calls upon the name of the Lord, you have his grace in you because he is in you, and he is grace. And grace is the betterment for us all as we are going through this life. And you get angry with your wife, for instance, and you're being a curmudgeon, uh, so to speak. And, uh, and those things happen at times. Well, the grace that's in you says, whoa, wait a minute, that's, that was, that's not proper. She, she is your vessel. By the way, I don't think a, a woman is weaker. That's, let, let me share something with you, ladies. Uh, but men, men are dirt. We're made from dirt. Some of y'all, I mean, I know some, I know, I know, I know some of you have been overwised, you know, and uh, you've been uh, somewhat in touch with your feminine feelings, but you're a man and you're made from dirt. Uh, women, on the other hand, they're made from not dirt, but they're precious. God specially designed a woman. It's like in the original Hebrew, many of you don't know this, but when God brought Eve to Adam, he went, wow, man. That's the original Hebrew, and it, and it morphed into woman over time. Some of y'all will catch that in your slow freight later. You didn't know you was dirt, did you? Local grace. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Biblical grace is the workings and the goings-ons within us so that we are overcomers. Matter of fact, more than overcomers. For his effectual work is within us, and this is from a relationship. And from this relationship, as we're going down the road, and, and as I often say this to many people, you're in your going, that's when you receive your healing. You don't, you don't, you're not going to see what it is that you need to receive by being stationary. You're not going to receive what you need to receive by complaining. I'm not saying it's not there. I'm not saying that, that those are not warranted at times. What I am saying is you've got to move forward to be an overcomer. Scripture says we're more than an overcomer. For this same spirit that rose Christ from the dead is in you. And by the way, biblical grace is this. It's not to make bad people good people. Biblical grace is to make us who were dead alive. Because we, we were an enemy against God. I know I was, and the Bible says we all were. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. He said we were at enmity against God. We were to put up our warfare against God. And one of the things about we as the church, what we have to get to, to a place and to a point, is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is here to save us, redeem us, and to make us into what he wants us to be, have the same mind that's in Christ. And so we should be uh, changing it, that, when that scripture says from glory to glory that means glory means excellence glory we're changing from being excellence to more excellence if I can use that word the superlative on that biblical grace it is the workings of the Holy Spirit convincing man that he's dead in his trespasses and sins. Then we have what's nat you know, natural grace. So natural grace, go to Acts 17, 14. 
And there's many other scriptures in the Bible that, uh, that also relate to this. And I'll get to one other, but there's many. Natural grace. We're talking about natural law. Natural law, we're not talking about the birds and the bees. Natural law has to do with the laws that are in motion. In other words, it has to be universal absolutes. I don't care what they've been teaching at Harvard and Princeton and Yale. They're, they keep saying there's no absolutes, and they're absolutely sure. Again, some of y'all catch that later. But that, that's what they do. They say the only absolute is the absolute for a professor to do research and to have teachings in the universities. That's their def definition of absolutes. But there is no such thing as a universal truth. There's no such thing as you know, murder like around the world. That's why in Vermont, several years ago, we had a judge up there. This uh, deviant uh, ended up uh, violating a young girl I think five or six times, and he got six months. Because this is what the judge said. He's been educated in the Ivy Leagues. See, something had to cause him to do it. How about evil, wickedness? But see, they, they said, well, sin is a causation that caused this man to do this wicked deed against this young girl. Then we shouldn't incarcerate him. Well, then let everybody out. The whole 1.5 million people that are incarcerated, let them out. Something caused them to do it. They're not guilty. Don't be surprised if there's not a movement to do that. <laughs> there really is. <laughs> Well, the people rose up and got angry with this judge, and they forced him out of, out, out of office. And I don't blame them. This is Vermont, one of the most liberal states in the union. And I'm glad, I'm glad they did that. He needs to be ran out. Acts 17, 14, in past generations, he let all nations go their own way. Yeah. He has not left himself without a testimony to his goodness. He gives you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, and this, this is there where they were in Lystra, Lystra and Derby, and they did those miracles. Even with these words, Paul Barnabas could hardly stop the crowds from sacrificing to them because they thought they were some Greek gods that came down from heaven. Here's a definition of natural law. Natural law is just as real as physical law. Did y'all hear me? Just as real as physical law. With perhaps the only difference, difference is in the length of time which it takes for the consequences to occur. Aren't you glad that God is long-suffering and patient? Slow to anger? Why he's been putting up with us? <laughs> The physical law, you, if you get, you, you have, you, know, you put water on a, on a stove and turn up the heat, it's going to boil. And it, it's pretty quick. The consequences of that's pretty quick. I could be violating my constitution the way God has created me by stealing or lying or some other activity that's not natural. And it might take a little bit longer, but it's going to take hold sooner or later. So, you're going to, unless you repent, unless we repent or pardon, then the consequences of that action, those actions. See, sin is unnatural. Don't you understand that? That's why we, it violates our conscience. It violates our constitution. That's why when I do something wrong to my wife, I immediately get convicted of what I said. And I know from Scripture it says, don't proceed, don't go on. I don't even want to hear your prayer until you make it right with your wife. That's, the, that's good Bible. That's just good Bible. And I know that God's not listening to me until I go to my wife and make amends to my wife. 
Are we really submitted? <laughs> there, are some, there are some natural law observations. The ones in the Ivy League that wants to say it's not here. All men want to be treated fairly. Would you say that? Very few men treat all men fairly, though. All men don't want to be lied to. You like being lied to? I don't. Very few treat all men honestly. Murder is murder. In Italy or here, it doesn't matter. Our actions are often contrary to our moral inclinations or understandings. Let's go to Matthew 7, 12. Here's another scripture for natural law. This is not from philosophy. This is straight out of the Bible. Most of the, of, of the philosophers of our time, a lot of people don't know this, but up until you know, the 16th century, all philosophers agreed that there was a supreme God. The difference is, is on, uh, was it, was it uh, the God of the Jews? Was it the God of, of this group, the Muslims, or whatever? But they all believed there was a supreme God. And then it began to shift and started, you know, that's when atheism and all this started coming in. Matthew 7, 12. So in everything, we just read these, these observations that we witness. So in everything, do to others what you have them do to you. You know, when I was teaching at that university on ethics, which is part of that vision, alignment, and execution, that eight-week course I was doing, I read them this verse. Now, I couldn't use scriptures unless they asked. If they asked, I could. But I read this by giving them chapter and verse. I respected their rules, but I still gave the Bible. You know, you can still give the Bible, folks. You can give the Bible your living epistle, read before all men. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. And I read this to those students, and they said, where did you get that? And I said, I got it out of the Bible. It was one of the first rules of ethics that I gave these students, and they never heard it before. And I, and I was amazed that they never heard this verse. For this sums up all the laws and the prophets. Can I get an amen? amen. Here's another one. Let's go to Romans 2, 13. And while I'm waiting out for you guys to get there, then I'll take a little water. You know, when you come to Christ and you submit to Christ and you're born again, you remember Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to Christ in private. And he said to Christ, what must I do? See, the kingdom of God was preached by Jesus Christ over a hundred times. It's recorded in the New Testament. Over a hundred times. That means there should be an emphasis on that. The kingdom of God. Now, it's interchangeable with the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. They're interchangeable. They're the same. Over a hundred times, Christ said, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God has come. Amen. See, if you have Christ in you, the kingdom of God lives in you and me. So it's not something we're waiting to go to. There will be a different emanation of that. In the future, we'll, we'll see the finality of our being in his presence. But, in, but the, the birth pangs of that, the seed of that, that's germinating in us, the kingdom of God is in you right now. If you have Christ as your Lord Savior, the kingdom of God is here right now in you. You don't have to wait. Your motive, it doesn't have to be, well, don't you want to go to heaven? 
and all of that, over a hundred times Christ said that. Romans 2, 13 through 14. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but it is the doers of the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when the Gentiles who do not have the law, in other words, the Mosaic law, do by nature, by nature, do by nature, See, they didn't have to have the Mosaic law. They knew lying was lying, stealing was stealing, murder was murder. It's just written down in the Ten Commandments when Israel became a nation. That was their, that was their uh, preamble. Who do not have the law, do by nature what the law requires. They are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. See, when you, Germany, after World War II, you know how they was able to convict the Nazis who did these atrocities? They based it on natural law. It wasn't, it wasn't the code of ethics that, that was given in terms of their mores of Germany or, or, or uh, the UN or any other place. By natural law, that's how they were. That's how they got convicted. Natural law tells you it's wrong to take innocent people and take them into a gas chamber, and separate them from their kids and their moms, and kill them. He that's in you, you're greater than he that's in the world. You're more than an overcomer. We are more than overcomers. That means there's something to overcome. <laughs> and usually it's us. But that whatever it is, when you listen to some of the testimonies of some of these uh, families, Jewish families, of which I have, and I'm sure that you have had, have had the privilege of doing that as well, and they talk about the trauma that they went through as a, a lad, seeing their mom and dad pulled away and murdered in these chambers, gas chambers. And they lived on. They never got to see their siblings again. They never got to see their mom and dad again. But they went on to do great exploits. Let me ask you a question. You think they got PTSD? Absolutely. <laughs> now, we need the, the church of Jesus Christ, we need to wake up and understand these words. You're more than an overcomer. Since they show that the word of the law is written on their hearts. Where's it written at? On the hearts. On the hearts. A great book. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Dan Slowiski or something like Bushiziski from UT, thank you. And he got a book out called A Line Through the Heart. And it's all about natural law. It's written, natural law is written on your heart. That's natural law, it's written on your heart. You it, it, it is there to teach us and guide us. We know. That's why all have sinned come short of the glory of God. But how do we get redeemed? How do we get pardoned? It's through Jesus Christ. It's not about joining a club, folks. You know, a Baptist club, a Catholic club, a Presbyterian club, a non-denominational club, an independent club, this club, that club. That's not going to get you into heaven because Nicodemus said, Rabboni, Master, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And he said, unless you're born again from above, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And so, just because you're in, in, in part of a club, a denomination, that does not guarantee you access to the kingdom of God. It's, here's the access, that the blood of Christ has covered you. 
you repented of your sin and you've been born from above. And there's the last part to it. And that he's working on you and I for the rest of our lives. It's called being submitted. He's the king. I'm the subject. He knows better what's... That's why he gave us his word. It says all scripture is God breathed for correction and reproof and encouragement and teaching. You're supposed to be a disciple. I'm going to say some things that might step on some toes, but in the church across, and those listening by the web and so forth, the church, and don't send me your letters, most, the church really, we're just, all of us are independent and everybody knows everything. So, I got about another 15 minutes. I'll, let me get, tell you a story. So when I went to Nigeria, and this first time I went there some years ago, and I went there by myself, I was a white dot in a black sea. Let me, let me dispel a, a thing. There is no such thing as a minority. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Thomas Sowell, who is a black PhD from Berkeley, who now works in a think tank, he, he, every ethnic group, if you take it globally, we all, all of us, Asian, white, blacks, Mexicans, whatever, we only, each one only makes up about 15% of, of the different ethnic groups all around the globe. Where there is, and accurately stated, a minority is geographical. So like when I was in Nigeria, I was the minority. But as a race, I'm not globally. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? We've been brainwashed. So I get there, and I mean, it was it was it was really an experience. So I get to worry, and worry is called the armpit of Africa. And these guys, and some of them have been with me, Mike and Dave and Johnny. And it is it's 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 pretty rough. So I'm going, I'm hitting back, and I had two drivers. Stanley and Joseph, kamikaze pilots. And the roads are horrendous. I drove up there from, from Lagos to Wari, and I mean, it's all dirt roads, most of it. It's all dirt roads with potholes, you name it. I mean, it is like going way back in the 30s or 40s. So they're going to take me to go back to Lagos to get my, catch my flight. So before we leave, being from America, I got to make sure we got real prepared, right? So I asked the guys, I said, hey, do we got a full tank of gas? Diesel, they were using diesel. Uh, have you checked the tires? I didn't want to miss my flight. I had an incentive. Uh, yes, yes, we know what we're doing. We know what we're doing. Uh, all right. We take off and get in the Jeep. <laughs> I'm sitting in the back, and I mean, these guys are like driving crazy, going, I don't know how fast, but. So I, we get to the next city, which is Benin, and they're driving in circles. And I, after a while, I went, hey guys, why are y'all driving around in circles? And they go, we're looking for petrol. For us people here in America, that's gasoline. We're looking for petrol. I said, I thought you said you filled it up back there in, in Warri. Uh, no, we know what we're doing. We know what we're doing. I said, I just know we're wasting a lot of time looking. Plus, you're wasting all this gas driving in circles. Why don't you just fill it up over there? And going to find out later they did that because they were going to save two cents on a gallon, but they wasted all that driving in circles trying to find a station that had some petro. petro. It's not like here. Believe me, electricity, gas, all, it's not, nothing like it is here. You just don't go down to the 7-Eleven and get some gas. You got to go find it. And then when you find it, it might be out. 
So anyway, we get some petrol, we take off, boom, we go back down the road. We're heading down the road. And over there in Nigeria, they have roadblocks with armed guys that stop you and check you out and all this kind of stuff. And just before we get to this first uh, blockade, military blockade, I hear this pow. I said, guys, I think we just got a flat tire. No, we don't have a flat tire. We have no flat tire. We know what we're doing. I said, I know you know what you're doing. But then all of a sudden, boom, boom, boom. So I, I'm, not, I'm not too worried because I asked them, hey, did you check the spare out? Did you get the right? So I'm thinking, well, man, we'll change our put spare on there and keep on going. I pull out the spare, it's flatter than a doornail. I said, I thought you guys told me that y'all checked. But don't, don't tell us what to do. We know what we're doing. And I wanted to say I didn't. I wanted to say, no, you don't either. <laughs> well, fortunately, there was a uh, place there to fix tires. And I'm going to tell you how they fix tire there. It's with a machete. That's all they use. Don't put it up on a tire rack and push it. They take them, they get fat grease and they put it on there and they take a machete to get the tire off and plug the hole and put it back on. I mean, it was incredible. So anyway, so they're jacking up the, the Jeep. I think most women in here know not to do this. They don't put it on the body. Because you... <laughs> All you're going to do is raise the body up, right? I'm going somewhere with this. It's kind of a little interesting story, but I'm going somewhere with it. If you hadn't caught on yet. So they put it underneath the jack underneath the body, and I said, guys, that's not going to work. So leave us alone. We know what we're doing. We know what we're doing. Both of them would be saying it at the same time. This time I did say it. I said, no, you don't. So they get it up. The tire's still here, and the body's up here. So now they, they lower it. Do, 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 do. Then they got a bunch of blocks, and then they sit on top of a block and said, guys, that's not going to work. They're leaving us alone. We know what we're doing. I said, no, no. So they put it in. Here's the body. Just went up higher. <laughs> the tire's still on the ground. I said, listen, guys, let me show you how to do this. So I get down on, in the dirt, and I showed them to put it underneath the axle. Changed the tire. Changed the tire, got back in the car. I told them, now this time, get both tires fixed. So they did. They found, I even gave them the money. I said, here's them, get it done. So we take off, boom, we're going down the road again. Shoo. They had one song in the eight track over and over the whole way. This is what? Now, this was a five hour trip. It took us 12 hours, all because of lack of planning. And don't tell us what to do. We know what we're doing. Know what we're doing. So we're, I mean, we're hooking. Bam! And they got the music sound so loud. I said, guys, we got another flat. No, we don't have no flat. I said, we got a flat. I just heard a blow. No, what? So he rolls down his window, and he sticks his, he's about halfway out the window, and we're going about 90 miles an hour. He looks back, he jumps back in, he, he looks at the driver and goes, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> Believe it or not, when we stopped, there was another place there to fix tires, right where we stopped that. I said, look, let's change the tire, get that tire fixed. We were running on me pops, man. So we change the tire, we take off. On the way, this is no joke, when we finally pulled up into the hotel and we got out, we're outside of the Jeep and we're stretching. The back tire goes, I gave him $100. I said, listen, go buy some tires, will you? You know, I've got to get to the airport the next, you know, in the morning. Well, they went and bought two used tires. They didn't buy two new ones. <laughs> anyway, my point is, why don't we listen sometimes? 
Why don't we plan? Why don't we humble ourselves? Why don't we realize we don't know everything all the time? And just maybe I might learn something from my colleagues, my friends, and so forth. And instead of saying, no, 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 I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. I was speaking Bible. I can go to some verses right now, but I'm not. When I was a young lad, 14, they didn't have child labor laws back then. I got, I got promoted from picking up golf balls off a golf course and started uh, stacking groceries at the commissary at Fort Hood. My mother was the third in charge there. And while I was there, it was on a Saturday. This place was incredible. It had 50-something cash registers. I mean, all of them just full of GIs. And so my mother would walk the floor and check with the cashiers. And Well, this one time there was a lady that was there. She was pregnant. Well, she had to go to the bathroom. So my mother said, well, go ahead and I'll, I'll take care. I'll take your place until you get back. So my mom was there checking out some GIs. One GI comes through and gives her 20 for a carton of cigarettes. They always had two or three MPs on duty there because there was so much cash going on. That was back before the credit cards. So my mom waved over the MP and said, this is a counter fit, a $20 counterfeit. So the MPs was a sergeant, arrested the sergeant, kept him there. Then a full bird colonel showed up who went to Fort Knox training for counterfeit money. Went to, that was his specialty. That was his whole, get, became a full bird colonel, just being able to detect counterfeit currency. So my mom never went to any schooling, but she handled so much money, she could feel the money and tell if it was a counterfeit. Four colonel shows up and begins to tell my mother that she's wrong, that this was not a counterfeit. And my mother said, yes, it is. I can tell I can, from the touch. It is counterfeit. Full borough colonel said, we got to send this off to the lab. And I'm guaranteeing you, it, when it comes back, it's not going to be a counterfeit. My mother said, you want to bet on it? So the colonel said, I'll bet you a 20. I said, all right. They sent it off. Several weeks later, the colonel came up to my mom, pulled his wallet out, gave her a $20 bill, and said, you were right. So you can have all the training in the world, but if you haven't touched the Christ, you're not going to know the uh, authenticity of who the real Christ is. Also, I will say this. When the Holy Spirit comes, and he does, and he touches you and I, are we genuine? Or are we a counterfeit? Just a thought. Just a thought. Father, I thank you for your love and your mercy. I thank you for all that you have given us and everything that you've done. You can't do any more than what you've done already. I start with me and I pray that I'll be the first one in line to say that I want to thank you for everything. And the times that I have not been grateful, please forgive me. Help me, Lord, to love you and to love your people. 
so that we can fulfill the Great Commission, the mandate to go into all this world and bring people into the kingdom. I ask this in your name, Lord. Amen. I feel like we need a song. Dave, you want to sing? Come on up. Oh, come let 